Former Minister of Finance and Pioneer Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment Olusha Gwaganga has detailed how Nigeria can achieve economic growth and prosperity. He detailed this in his book, Reclaiming the Jewel of Africa. The book has been called a blueprint for taking Nigeria and Africa from potential to prosperity. It documents Aganga's activities and experiences in and out of government. It also uh, chronicles uh, a whole lot of his experiences and it essentially contains recommendations for Nigeria and Africa to take the needed leap to enviable heights. The book has been endorsed by various political leaders in Nigeria and outside the country. Now let's speak with the author of that book, former Minister of Finance and Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Olusegun Aganga. He joins me live from our Lagos studios. Good to see you and thanks for your time. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> well, the excitement for me uh, has to do with uh, the burning story first. Before we get into your book, uh, you must have seen the uh, screening of ministers. Uh, perhaps uh, you had that experience before. Help us make a sense of what it was like when you came before the National Assembly during your time. Well, I had that experience twice, and I think it was very different. I was coming from England. I, was, uh, I had been in England for 30 years, and I came in uh, to serve. So it was very different for me. Uh, nothing I had experienced before. But you get a lot of help, assistance with people helping you, supporting you, giving a rough idea of what to, how, to, how to prepare. And you're told um, you could be asked to recite the pledge, you could, be you could be asked to recite the national anthem, and all sorts of questions. So in most cases, we are over-prepared. Uh, but the most important thing is to be polite. Um, do not be embarrassed by any question and um, try and respect the senators. Uh, most of the work is done outside that room. So the DSS would have managed, would have looked at your security report. And of course, the three senators from your state would have indicated uh, their support uh, before you appear before the Senate. But the important thing is to be very confident, not overconfident, but confident, polite, and try not to be embarrassed. And I think if you do that, you get away with it. I really wish we had this conversation before the screening. This would have come really handy for those who uh, came, be <laughs> <laughs> came before the National Assembly. Uh, well, again, yeah. you know, you were Minister of Trade and Investment, and at that point in time, we must say, Nigeria experienced a significant improvement uh, in FDI. Uh, how can the current administration get Nigeria working again as it relates to FDI. Well, that actually is addressed in the book. I think that is in chapter four or five of the book. And the idea is, you see, investment is the blood that drives the economy. And, and the number of things you need to do, I did share my, my thoughts about how we successfully made Nigeria the number one destination for investment in Africa. Um, I went through the whole process we went through and how I visited, visited about 68 different countries, some of the time with the president, marketing Nigeria, telling our stories. But the most important thing to start with is that you must have a stable and strong macroeconomic environment. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that's a lot of what, that's what this government needs to focus on now. And you can't rely on the CBN governor alone. You need the economic ministries working with the CBN to get that done. But it is critical. No investor will come into this country if the macroeconomic environment is not strong and stable and predictable. Uh, the, the second point is, of course, the business environment, uh, making sure that you know, it's easy to do business, regulations, and all that. But the most important thing is the macroeconomic environment. The opportunities are here. The raw material is here. With, yes, the market, we have a big market, but that market, we need to work on the market. We need to empower the middle class and turn them to a very, very strong consumer group. 
we still have some work to do in that area. But the most important thing right now is to focus on the macroeconomic environment. And when I say that, I'm talking about inflation, I'm talking about exchange rate, I'm talking about interest rate, I'm talking about public debt management. Uh, we're in a hole there, and we need to do far much more to take ourselves out of the hole. And then we go out and tell our stories. There are mostly policies in place to attract investments into the country. Um, and the opportunities are there. The Industrial Revolution Plan is there. All they need to do is work on it, implement it. There are 13 items in the Industrial Revolution Plan that will attract not only just investment into the country, but foreign income into the country, which we need right now to help what? manage the exchange rate. Uh, uh, well, you spoke about Chapter 4, but again, let, let's quickly see what we find on Chapter 1, which is uh, basically on leadership, governance, uh, political structure. Uh, let us have an idea of uh, the main issues and uh, what we need to do differently in Nigeria. Well, there are a number of things. The, the, the vision I have set is a vision where Nigeria becomes one of the most prosperous and great nations in the world. And the idea is, what do we need to do to get there? The fundamentals are strong, the potential is there, but what is holding us back? And that is what the book tries to address in the 10 chapters. And the first chapter deals with leadership and governance. Now, the first is about the democracy we practice. Are we doing well? And the best way to assess our, our progress is the Democracy Index by the Economist Intelligence Unit of the Economist Group. You'll find that since 1999, Nigeria has been a hybrid regime. There are four classes, full democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid regime, and authoritarian regime. We're just one step ahead of being an authoritarian regime. And we've been that for 23 years. We need to move to floor democracy. Now, democracy also makes a number of assumptions. It assumes that the, the, the electorates are educated to some extent, there's financial independence, but majority of our voters are poor and illiterate, which means that we're caught in what I call the Bermuda Triangle, where Leaders are chosen and decided on based on three major things, tribe, religion, and money. And which means that competence, character, vision is not a prerequisite for the type of political leadership we run in the country. That is the state way, and we have to address that. And there are many ways to address that while we try to improve our literacy, address the issue of poverty. I've suggested looking at something like proportional representation in a way that we can have some level of opposition. We run a presidential system today, copying America, a very, very big economy. The question is, is the presidential system the right thing for the size of the economy we have in the country? And the answer is no. We should be looking at other things. Switzerland came up with a hybrid system, combining the presidential and the parliamentary system. The presidential system doesn't work, it's expensive, there's no opposition. The check and balances we expect to have between the executive, the, the legislators, and of course, the um, uh, judiciary is not there. So we need, and there are a lot of conflict of interest in the constitution and the way we operate the presidential system. And those are the things we need to look at in terms of uh, what we need to do uh, differently. There needs to be a very a new code of conduct. And if you and I look at the constitution today, what affects you and I most are things that are assigned to the local governments. I ask you, who is your local government chairman? You probably don't know your local government chairman. And when you look at elections, the state that controls, the party that controls the state actually determines who the local government chairman is and the board. And, in, and of course, they are not properly funded which means that things that affect you and I, about roads, about schools and sanitation and all that are not properly addressed. So we need to look at a number of things. Is the presidential system working, is democracy working the way it should?
can we just make some changes? And I've made a number of recommendations in the book of what we can do in the short term, medium term, and long term. But we must address that if we are to have the sort of political leadership we need to move Nigeria to where it ought to be. One of the most prosperous nations in the world, one of the greatest nations in the world. We have everything that we require to be one of the top nations in the world. Yeah, is that the book uh, sort of also went into dem democracy, which is very important. And the next question many Nigerians and even economists and financial experts like yourself want us to find out from you is how Nigeria can use democracy to achieve its investment potential, especially in the face of uh, lots of influences. Could, could you repeat that again? Now, I'm talking about how Nigeria can use democracy to achieve its uh, potential, investment potential. No, dem dem democracy is important, and that's why we... That's why all countries adopt it, but you have to adopt it in a way that it works for your country. At the moment, when you define democracy, democracy is supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I ask you, is it the way we practice democracy today, would you confidently say it's a government by the people, for the people, of the people? And the answer is no. And the reason why it's, the answer is no, is because our political system, the way it's run today, does not attract some of the best people in the society. Secondly, they are run as, as platforms. There's no ideology, there's no internal, internal democracy is weak. That's not a problem. So once you identify the problem, you have 70, 80% there. So what we need to do is strengthen our democratic institutions, institutions that support democracy, like the political parties. It's important that political party financing is very clear. It's important that there's internal democracy. It's important that they attract the best people. But more importantly, it's important that people go into business, go into business to serve, and that politics is not more, it's not a route for generating wealth. If you're looking for wealth, you need to go to the private sector. But you want to serve, serve your country with so much pride and your people, then politics is the right route for you. And that's, that's, that's the sort of training, understanding we need to have as a people. Okay, you know, in all of this, you emphasize in the book the importance of uh, uh, a value-based and uh, order society as well as institutions. Can you briefly expatiate on this? Right. History has shown that the most successful nations in the world and the most successful companies in the world are built on their core values. History and research has shown that the difference between a rich and a, a poor country, it not, it's not necessarily about the demography. It's not necessarily about the, the, the solid minerals they have in the country or the natural resources they have in the country. It's more about the people. It's about the attitude of the people. It's about the values of the people. Values is a foundation on which you build your institutions. Values of patriotism, integrity, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the compassion, all those things. So we hear today, you, you hear about the American values. You hear about the British values, the English values. Singapore had its own values embedded in their constitution and their society. We need to, to embed, identify those values and agree on them to start with, and make sure that those values are what unite us as Nigerians, as what de defines us as a people. So that it's very clear, you know, what is right and what is wrong. Today, there was a time when our, our value system worked and worked very well. The days where 
If people did not know the source of your income, you are ostracized from the society. This is not, we need to change that, and that has effect across the board. You know, you, you wrote extensively about the economy and uh, had a number of recommendations. Uh, uh, now, with the current situation in Nigeria, uh, share with us, if you will, the five top recommendations. If I was sitting in front of the president today, my first, my, my, my first um, advice would be appoint technocrats or competent politicians with experience and track record to head economic ministries and agencies and to sit on the board of these agencies. You see, appointments into the MDAs should not be the dividend of democracy. Dividend of democracy should be good governance. So it's the force is getting the right technocrats or competent politicians in the MDAs, economic MDAs. The second point is the point I made earlier, which is the macroeconomic environment. And you need the economic ministries working with the CBN to achieve this. You need to set targets for the MDAs, create a business environment that will attract and retain investments and implement the NCCG uh, for all the government agencies. The second and perhaps the most important thing is to look at the funding model of the country, which requires you, which requires looking at the sources and the applications of government finances. This takes us to the cost of governance. Cost of governance, the leakages in the, in, the, in the system, the wastage in the system, the corruption in the system, you need to bring, you, need, we can, you cannot have a small state revenue and a large state expenditure relying on borrowing to fund your recurrent expenditure. So, and it has to start with the government. The government has to start, set the example of cutting down on cost of governance. And it has to start from the top. That is as important as generating revenue. When I was Minister of Finance, we produced about 2 million barrels of oil a day. This was about 2010, 2011. The idea, I wrote that in the book, was that we should be producing 3 to 4 million barrels a day. Today, we can only account for, this eight years after, we can only account for maybe 1.4 million barrels a day because this leakage, or we say about 80% of what is going through the export line is stolen. That has to be addressed immediately. That's where the foreign income comes in. That's what is boost up your reserve. That's what you need to help manage your exchange rate as well. So, but the cost of governance is what we can deal with almost immediately. And it has to start from the top. And I call it the sources, as an accountant, I call it the sources and application of government finances. We have to tighten the belt, and it has, we are asking people to make sacrifices, but they will make those sacrifices if they see us from the top demonstrating that. So I think that's, that's, those are some of the things I will um, focus on. And of course, I will encourage the government to immediately start implementation of the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan and the uh, Nigerian Enterprise Development Plan for the MSMEs. You need to do that because about, I think 50% of our GDP is from the MSMEs and they, country, they, they account for about 76% of the workforce of the country. So it's important that there are about 40 million uh, uh, according to the last survey. So that's a group and I would say revive immediately the SME councils at the federal and the state level, revive the competitiveness council immediately, and of course, uh, make, revive the Industrial Revolution Plan uh, Council. There's no nation, there's no nation that, that, that has become a rich nation by producing raw materials 
without having a strong industrial base and advanced services sector. The more you specialize in producing raw material, importing the items you consume, the poorer you become as a nation. That is why the Industrial Revolution Plan is so critical. Other countries are, some countries have done number one, number three, number four, number five Industrial Revolution Plan. We have not done any. And there's a plan there that we need to implement immediately. Now, you just said that there is a plan there. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, we should be asking what are the expectations? And again, quickly here, uh, since this book is published in England, uh, is it available in Nigeria? It's available in Nigeria. Um, the first set was important from, from the UK because it was published in the UK. But it is available at Roving Heights Bookshop in Lagos, Abuja, and online. So Roving Heights, you can easily get a book from, from uh, Roving Heights uh, here, here in Nigeria. And of course, it's available on Amazon and all the other international uh, bookstores. But Roving Heights have the stocks in Nigeria, and they've, they've done very well. They've sold over, over 600 or 700 copies uh, in the last uh, three weeks. Innovation in, in writing this book. Uh, and what's your motivation in writing this book? The motivation is simple. Uh, we all agree that Nig we know that Nigeria has potentials. We know that's why it's part of the N it was part of the N11. That is why it was part of the mid economy. But the question is, why has Nigeria not achieved its potentials for this for so long? And that's a question we keep on asking ourselves because we say we are not where we know we should be. When you speak to anyone, some will tell you it's all to do with leadership. Others will tell you it's all to do with corruption. My experience in and out of government tell me that it's far much more than that. So what I've done is to put together a comprehensive thing, what I call the chains, the chains that are holding us back. I'm saying, here are the chains. This is how we break the, these chains, looking at different examples from different countries. If we break that chain, we will walk majestically into that place we want to, that vision of being one of the most prosperous and greatest country in the world. Because we are capable, we have what it takes to be one of the most prosperous nation in the world. So well, that's the motivation, and I'm hoping. And, and, and one thing I want to make clear, that it's, it's not about government alone, it's for people in government, it's for everyone. We're all stakeholders, we're all leaders, we, are, we, are, we all have a role to play, whether you're a religious uh, leader, or you are a, a traditional ruler, or you're in the private sector, you're a student, we all have a role to play as, a citizen, as citizens of this great nation. And I'm saying we can't leave everything to government, we all have a role to play. I'm encouraging everyone to look at that. We have a great future ahead of us. If we work together and address issues of this country, we will be one of the most prosperous nations in the world. Good thing here is that a lot of people want to share in your optimism. But again, how can we bring a lot of people's attention, the government included uh, here, uh, to our economy because there seem to be some kind of insufficient attention on Nigeria's economy? Well, there has to be because Nigeria is the number one. If you're not in Nigeria, you're not in Africa. And Africa needs Nigeria to rise. For Africa to be great, Nigeria has to rise. So uh, it's important that Nigeria does what it needs to do not only for Nigeria and Nigerians, but for Africa overall. And I think the world is looking at Nigeria to demonstrate that leadership and commitment and responsibility. I think Nigerians want to do it. Even Nigerians in the diaspora want, the, the one point I want to make clear is that no matter how successful you are in the diaspora, you will always, always be referenced back to your country, Nigeria. It's in your interest. We all benefit from that goodwill we create for our great country. So I think the, 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 the people in government want to be re-elected. 
But the, the only sad thing is that no, it, it, we have not seen anyone lose or win elections because of the economy. And that is one of the reasons why I think we have not, uh, the economic greatness has eluded us. It's not one of the things, and we need to bring this to the attention of the average Nigerian, that when they are voting, it's not just about tribe, it's not about religion, it's not about money, it's about who, it's about the, the good society we want to create, it's about the economy, and the economy does not really know whether you are from the east, south, north, or whatever. So it's important that we elect competent people with good character, values, and will have the strong vision. And the idea, many people have bought the book for members of the National Assembly. Uh, someone bought about 400 copies for uh, higher institutions. So the idea, the more people read this, the more people get to know about what needs to be done and their own role about what they need to do. Uh, uh, their, their own contribution, yes. The here is that you're also contributing to the reading culture of uh, Nigeria. But quickly here, the Financial Reporting Council has helped to achieve a massive sector in Nigeria's private sector through the National Corporate Code of Governance. Help us. How can this be achieved with government institutions? Well, I, I was privileged to set up the committee to develop Nigeria's uh, national uh, code of corporate governance. So actually it started with me uh, as a minister when Jim Obazi was the DG of the FROC, Financial Reporting Council. And the, 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 the exciting thing about it was that it was going to apply to the private sector, to the public sector, and to the NGOs. Now, we needed to consult more on the NGOs, and that's why it was not implemented before I left government. But the, most of the work, 90% of the work was done. It has been implemented in the private sector, and it's working very well. All that we need to do is for the president to use his green pen and say we need to apply this in the public sector. And for the National Assembly to look at the laws of the the laws of the uh, agencies, and insert, and, and insert there that they need to comply with the NCCG. If we do that, there'll be dramatic change in the quality of our institutions. And that is critical, because nations fail or succeed depending on the quality of the institutions we have in the country. When institutions are weak, nations fail. The corporate governance will strengthen our institutions. The president has, the, 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 the board have been dissolved. There are only three things we need to do with all the agencies. Introduce and incorporate the NCCG, Make sure that people who appoint into positions, the DJs, the board, are competent, people with good track record. Set them performance targets in terms of development, service quality, monitor. Only four things. It's, that's not rocket science, and that's not difficult to do. But you will see a dramatic change if we do those things. And they're looking back, are there policies of government or programs that need to be strengthened? Perhaps maybe there are some that have been stopped by previous administrations. The, the good news about Nigeria, and when you look at the book, is that we are, and I use the language of a hedge fund manager, we are long on policies and plans, we are short on implementation. Saying there's no policy, we have most of the policies and plans in place. Our problem has always been in the implementation or the quality of implementation and continuity. Every government comes, discuss what the other government has done, come up with another plan. Look at agriculture. We've had so many plans in agricultural transformation, uh, the, the green revolution, the, all sorts of things. In the same, and whereas all you need is a strong plan 
to turn agriculture, make it a commercial agriculture, and move from just raw materials to value addition. Link them to the uh, research centers, innovation and everything, just to make sure that um, we're more efficient in what we do. Now, you can review the same policy after five, 10 years. South Africa's auto policy has been in place for 50 years. And all they do is review it every five or seven years. But it's been in place for 50 years. That was why, in, I think in 2011, we were looking at the sort of income that, or, that Africa generated from the Agoa scheme with America from when we were looking at non-oil. We saw that Africa generated about $4 billion from America under Agoa, but about 3.8 billion of that went to South Africa. Uh, and the rest was, went to Mauritius and, and, and to Kenya, flowers. But South Africa got the large chunk of it because they were exporting cars and parts from South Africa to America. They have had that policy for 50 years. We don't have that history. So we have enough, we're long on plans. We are long on policies. We are short on implementation, quality of implementation. And the worst thing is that there is no continuity. For us to leave it, former Minister of Finance and Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Lucia Guagnaga, and the author of the book, Reclaiming the Jewel of Africa. Many thanks for speaking with us. Thank you.